Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We are here to talk about the clinic emergency preparedness. Um, this event is being recorded. The link to where the recording will be posted will be sent in an email following the completion of today's webinar. My name is Latrell Courtney, and I'm a program specialist with the National Rural Health Resource Center, who is providing this webinar today. Um, your audio is muted by default to avoid any background noise and feedback. Uh, please remain muted unless you have a question. Um, to unmute your line, you can please select the microphone icon in the lower left corner of your screen. And if you dial in from a phone, you can press star pound to unmute your line. Um, you can also communicate through the chat box, which is located on the bottom ribbon in the middle of your screen. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to type your name, title, and organization in the chat box so we know who is joining us today. Um, this helps us get a good look of feel of um, the audience who attends this webinar. The National Rural Health Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sustaining and improving healthcare in rural communities. The center is the TA provider for the Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program. The Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in collaboration with the Delta Regional Authority. The center is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism and building a culture where difference is valued. Um, you can learn more about our commitment to diversity on our website. And here are some of our current upcoming webinars. We have the clinic webinar series, maintaining compliance in your RHC, June the 27th from 11 to noon, the social media webinar, using the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why, July the 9th. And also we have the social media webinar, how to optimize one piece of content across multiple platforms on July the 16th from 11 to noon. And uh, before we introduce today's speaker, um, Caleb will launch the polling question. If you would please fill out the polling as it will help us with our future program evaluation. Today's speaker is Steve Smith. Steve is with Forbes. He's a member of their Healthcare Performance Improvement Practice Unit, and he serves as the practice unit's lead for rural health performance improvement. Um, Steve provides consultant services to hospitals, physician practices, rural health clinics, federally qualified healthcare centers, and other provider groups related to revenue cycle performance, RAC established operations, and compliance. Thank you, Steve, for being here today, and I'll hand it over to you. Sounds great. Thank you, Latrell. Um, hopefully, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see, it may have gone away. And let me know if that comes through okay. Yep, looks great, Steve. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for taking out some time here this morning, uh, potentially this afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, I do see some familiar names uh, in the attendees. So uh, for those of you I've had the opportunity to meet before, great to see you again. Uh, for those that I haven't, thanks for for being here with us today. Um, you know, today we're really going to focus on emergency preparedness, and that that is going to dovetail a little bit into the session that we're going to do next week related to uh, maintaining RHC compliance. Uh, emergency preparedness is a very big part of that compliance plan, and so um, just know there's going to be a little bit of an overlap, uh, just at least with that section when we get into next week's uh, uh, webinar series. Um, but today we're really just going to focus strictly on those emergency preparedness plans. Uh, as you may or may not know, hopefully you do if you're operating a rural health clinic today, uh, you are required to have a emergency preparedness plan in place, and that needs to be an active plan. So it's not good enough to just draft something up, have it on paper, have it signed off and approved, and uh, then ultimately go up on a shelf and not be used again. This is an active, living, breathing plan uh, that does have to be continually monitored, updated, uh, and maintained uh, by the clinic. And it will certainly be something that come the recertification surveys that rural health clinics have to go through, that certification agency is going to look at your emergency preparedness plan and, and see what's ultimately been done. So, you know, our agenda here today, really, first and foremost, we want to just kind of set forward, okay, what does the final rule say we have to do 
in order to meet emergency preparedness plan requirements. Then we're gonna get into, again, when that surveyor does come on site and they wanna look at this thing, what is this gonna mean for us? Now, keep in mind, even if you're not yet a rural health clinic, you're going through the process of trying to become one, you still have to have an emergency preparedness plan in place. You won't have tabletop exercises, you won't have after action reports, uh, you won't have some of that formal documentation, but you do have to have that plan developed and in place. So we do wanna make sure that whether you're starting a rural health clinic or you're an existing and operating rural health clinic, you're aware of what those survey procedures are gonna be because they will likely be very similar, if not the exact same. Uh, do have some emergency preparedness plan resources at the end of the, the um, presentation here. Th those links will be available to you. Uh, as Latrell mentioned earlier, uh, once everything is done and sent out, you'll be able to have those links and uh, certainly be able to ask or, or uh, reference those materials. And then do want to hopefully leave a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, I will say as we go through the presentation here today, if you do have a question, feel free to put that into the chat. Uh, I will try my best uh, to monitor that as we go here. Um, and then um, if, if there's anything we're unable to, to answer, we'll certainly reach out to you following the presentation uh, with some guidance on, on whatever question that you did have. Uh, one piece of, of housekeeping, um, I am actually in a hotel here today. In theory, I have a late checkout, but uh, in the event, I have to step away from the laptop here for just a minute, just to understand, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure they're going to let me stay in the room here for a little bit longer. Um, but uh, with that, we can go ahead and start diving in. So first and foremost, if we're gonna comply with a requirement or a regulation, we have to understand what that regulation is. So we do wanna make sure we cover this overview of what is the final rule related to emergency preparedness plans. Uh, and, and as of September 16, this now applies to all supplier types. In the past, some supplier types, FQHCs, RHCs among them, were able to get outside of the emergency preparedness plan requirement. Uh, that is no longer the case. As of November 2017, you have to comply with this. So everyone had effectively a little bit more than a year uh, to get their emergency preparedness plan in place uh, if they weren't required to have one when they became an RHC, and then ultimately begin to work under that plan to meet all of those various requirements. And so we have to do this. I mean, this is not an optional thing. We can't opt out because of the size of our clinic or anything like that. It's not like a a cost report where we can say, hey, we're, we're low Medicare utilization, so we're not really gonna file a full cost report this year. That's not the case. If you do not have an emergency preparedness plan in place, either at the time of your initial certification survey or your recertification survey, you are certainly at risk of losing your RHC status or not able to obtain RHC status. So if you don't already have one of these in place, please, please, please make it a top priority to get this done as soon as possible. Um, so that in the event those recertification or initial certification surveys take place, you're prepared because this absolutely is something that uh, the surveyors are going to look at, whether that's the state, the compliance team, Quad A, Joint Commission, whoever it is, they are going to look for this documentation and make sure that you're meeting these requirements that are laid out below. Emergency plan and risk assessment, policies and procedures, a communication plan, training and testing, and an integrated plan. Uh, the integrated plan, we're going to spend a little bit of time on. There's a lot, been a lot of confusion around that area, so we will get into that in a little bit more detail, um, but, but we'll, we'll touch on that as we get to that point. So first and foremost, we can't develop an emergency plan unless we know what our risks are, and that's where this risk assessment comes in. So under this risk assessment, we have to develop an all-hazards approach based on our facility and our community-based risk. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that really means is you have to sit down as leadership and say, hey, there's a potential, I, I'm, I'm in the Midwest, I'm in Kansas, a tornado hitting our building better be on my emergency preparedness plan. A hurricane, probably not so much, but we need to make sure that we're going through and doing those exercises to say, hey, what are those things that we think we have a risk of them impacting our business? This could be things like cybersecurity, this could be power outages, um, this could be active shooters. This could be um, uh, well, the, the most recent one that we've seen, a, an epi uh, some kind of a healthcare epidemic. All of these things need to be taken into consideration. Environmental, personal, technical, all those items need to be reviewed, assigned a, a risk um, amount. So how likely do we think this is going to happen? 
And if it were to happen, what do we think that impact would be? Um, we have to identify all of those items so that we can then go in and effectively create an emergency preparedness plan. So step number one is that risk assessment and making sure that we identify what do we think has the potential to impact our clinic. Once that's done, it can't just be sat on a shelf and, and never heard from again. This has to be reviewed on an every two year period. And what I would say is, you know, if you initially say that something is, is let's say a four out of 10 uh, in, in terms of the probability that it's going to happen to our clinic, but in year one, it happened to our clinic. When you redo this, the surveyors are gonna expect that that's no longer a four out of 10. You've just shown based on your history that this can happen. So that, you know, it, it may still be somewhat unlikely to happen in the future, but I would argue it needs to be higher than a four. It may be a six, seven, eight, maybe rank in as a 10 because we know it's happened and, and there could certainly be a potential of it happening again. But this has to be reviewed every two years. So for all of your risks that you identify, what do you think that probability is now compared to when you first developed this, as well as what do you think the ultimate um, impact is going to be if that were to happen? This also has to be applicable to each individual clinic. So if you have clinics that span multiple areas, and let's say one of them is in an area that may be more prone to flooding uh, than another may be, then the expectation would be the flood um, potential for occurrence would be higher for that location than it would that someplace that, that maybe sits on higher ground or, or just hasn't had that history of flooding. Um, so again, you can't just say, okay, we are XYZ hospital systems, we operate four rural health clinics, and here is the risk assessment. That, that's really not the level of specificity that we need to be shooting for here. Each individual facility is likely to have some that are going to vary from others. Now, some are going to be the exact same. Your cybersecurity, your environmental threats, now, again, flood may be one that's a little bit different. But if we look at things like hurricanes, things like tornadoes, all those sorts of things, those may be very likely to be the same. And I think you can make that argument, but you just need to make sure that you're taking a look at these on an individual clinic basis. Uh, you have to address your patient population. So, you know, should one of these things happen that we've identified, how are we going to provide services in this emergency situation? What is our continuity of operations look like? What do we have in place and, and what do we need to implement if and when this were to happen? And then, if something happens to a certain individual that holds a role as a part of that emergency plan, how does that get delegated? Uh, how does that authority get transferred if, if somebody's unavailable? Um, again, all those things need to be taken into consideration. And one of the other big ones is collaboration with local, tribal, regional, state, and federal officials. We need to make sure that we're not doing something that's going to be counterintuitive or counteractive to something that our state or local agencies are doing. So we need to make sure that we're coordinating with them and say, hey, you know, in the event a tornado were to happen, um, what does this look like? What do you what's your plan look like? And we need to make sure that ours can at least support that and isn't something that, again, is going to be counteracting the services that these other organizations are putting in place if that event were to take place. So we've developed our risk assessment. We've said, OK, here's how we're going to continue long term. Um, or potentially short-term, depending on the length of the event that we go through. But now we start to develop our policies and procedures around this. And so again, you're going to see a very common theme here. This has to be reviewed at least every two years. Now, one thing I'll mention here is you have to check your policies and procedures in your emergency preparedness plan and anywhere else that it's mentioned. Because if any of those policies and procedures state that you're going to review this on an annual basis as opposed to every two years, that's the standard that you're going to be held to. You're required to do it every two years, but you can be more proactive and do it annually if you would like. So if your procedures say, yeah, we're going to do this on an annual basis, well, then we need to make sure that we do it on an annual basis, even though the federal requirement is two years. I do want to make sure that we make that distinction. Be sure you know what your policies say and be sure that you're following those policies and following those policies to a T regarding the timeliness of, of how often this is gonna be reviewed. So our policies and procedures, there's a few things that we have to have in place. How are we gonna evacuate the RHC? Uh, how are we going to allow patients, to, uh, staff and volunteers to shelter if that's needed? 
so again, if, if we're looking at an active shooter situation, if we're looking at a environmental situation, um, where can they shelter? How can they shelter? How long can they shelter? Uh, what are our safe spaces? All those sorts of things need to be outlined in these policies and procedures. You do have to have a system of medical documentation that preserves patient information. So again, what kind of backups do we have in place? Uh, what kind of abilities do we have to make sure that because of this event, we don't lose this patient's history or we don't lose this patient's uh, medication utilization? All those things need to be thought of here when we're developing these policies and procedures. And then again, can we develop policies and procedures that state, hey, if this is to happen, we're going to call in emergency staff or we're going to call in volunteers or we're going to uh, liaise with state or federal professionals to address a surge need. Um, you know, if, if we're a rural health clinic and we do get hit uh, with, a, I'll just go back to tornado, just again, being from the Midwest, there's a chance that we're going to have a lot of injured individuals that may need care. Now, that's not to say as a rural health clinic, we're going to be their first area that they're going to go to. More than likely, they're going to head to the hospital. Um, we, you know, we could be dealing with orthopedic issues. We could be dealing with cardiac issues. There's just a lot of stuff that can happen. But we need to be prepared that if people need to be shifted to us, we're ready to care for them. And here's what we can and are willing to do if that were to be the case. So, again, our policies and procedures need to line all of these items out to make sure that we're prepared. Our communication plan, surprise, surprise, has to be reviewed at least every two years, again, unless specified otherwise by your internal policies and procedures. We need to have up-to-date information related to the staff that we work with, the vendors we work with, the physicians that we work with, either employed or contracted, uh, other RHCs and FQCs around the area, volunteers around the area. I would actually add to this other hospitals in the area. We need to know that if something were to happen, who do we contact and why, you know, what are the instances that we would contact them and then how do we contact them? And that's critical. We need names, we need phone numbers, we need emails, we need cell phone numbers, anything that we can get to develop that communication plan and that contact information for those individuals who we may need assistance from or we may need to liaise with. We have to have all that stuff readily available so we can go ahead and get in there. For all of our rural health clinics, you probably already have a lot of your internal staff on your uh, staff listing that's in your evidence binder. I would still recommend making sure you have names, emails, cell phones, home phones. Not like many people have landlines anymore, but just in case, let's let's get that down. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we have multiple ways to try to contact someone to let them know what's going on at the clinic and whether they need to come in or whether they need to stay away. And so that's where that communication plan truly comes in. Hey, this is going on. I need you here right now. We're all hands on deck. Or, hey, this is going on. I need you to stay away. It's not safe. Or uh, for one reason or another, we can't overwhelm the clinic. Or this is going on. We don't really know what we're going to do yet. Stay by the phone and, and be ready. We may need you to come in. You've got to have that ability to contact them. And if all you have is an email, how often are they going to check that email? If they're off site, if you only have a phone number, um, is there another way that we could potentially get to them? Um, you know, so again, we just want to have multiple ways that we can contact these individuals or these entities that are listed here in the event that we need to, so that we can coordinate efforts. And again, that that contact information for your federal, state, tribal, regional, local emergency preparedness staff, we got to make sure that we have that stuff available because questions will come up, uh, coordination will need to take place. So we need to make sure that we have the ability to get in contact with these folks the second that we need to. And it's not, oh, you know what? We have to go find that and, 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 and let's get that done. The other thing that I'll say here on the communication plan and, and this contact information, please, please, please have more than just a physical copy in the rural health clinic. Reason I say that is one of the risks that you're probably going to identify as you go through the process is fire. If those records are burned, if those records are drenched in water from a sprinkler system, they're probably not going to be usable. So what can we do to make sure that if something were to happen, we can still get access to this information? That could be storing it out on a shared drive on your network. That could be having a secondary physical copy somewhere else that, that hopefully would not be involved. 
Um, personally, I tend to lean towards have it stored somewhere on the network so that we can go out and make updates in one place and then we can print a hard copy if we need to. But make sure that your only copy is not a hard copy in the clinic. Because again, if a tornado hits that clinic, what are the chances that you're going to be able to find that piece of paper that has all this contact information on it for your emergency preparedness plan? Probably pretty low. And so again, we just need to make sure that we have that access. Staying with the communication plan, again, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, I don't want to berate this point anymore, but you do have to make sure that you have primary and alternate ways of contacting these individuals. Um, and, and really the goal here is we have to provide information out about the general condition and location of patients, as well as what our needs and our availability is. So from the patient perspective, we have to know that, hey, uh, Steve is in and, and have an XYZ done um, when this thing hit. Um, we can be able, if a, if a family member were to call, uh, we can let them know what's going on with Steve. Again, we have to be mindful of HIPAA, of all, all those good things that we have to be mindful of anytime we share information. But we can at least give some of that general information and location about Steve uh, to the individuals that are, that are calling for an update. At the same time, uh, we have to make sure that we can provide that assistance to whoever has authority uh, at the time that this event does take place. And so, you know, if, if we don't have this formal communication plan drafted up and, and ready to go with primary responsibilities and uh, backups and, and delegates and, and all those sorts of things, the opportunity for this to go poorly is just exacerbated. We have to make sure that we're prepared and the communication plan is one of the very, very bedrocks of making sure that that is done. The other is training and testing. And I know nobody loves anything more than sitting down and doing a tabletop exercise or training their staff on uh, emergency preparedness. And I'm sure the staff love being trained on emergency preparedness because many times they may read that and say, there's no chance this is gonna happen. But in the event that it does, we need to make sure that we're trained and we need to make sure that we're prepared on what we're going to do and what we've committed to doing, should that event take place. And so, you know, your initial training in emergency preparedness is going out to everybody. And so, you know, everyone is aware of what our plan is, what our risks are that we've identified, how we're going to respond to those risks, what their uh, roles and responsibilities may be if they've been assigned something. All that has to be implemented when that initial emergency preparedness plan is rolled out for the clinic. In addition, there has to be a retraining that takes place at least every two years. Now, again, if your policy states, we're gonna redo all this stuff annually, then you're gonna have to train annually. But if, if you say that we're gonna do it every two years, then, then you do that uh, backup and, and additional training on an every two year cycle. This one I cannot stress highly enough maintain documentation of the training that has taken place for all of your staff. And I'll add one more thing. Make sure that if you have someone who hasn't completed that training, you track that individual down and they complete that training as soon as possible. The last thing that you want to have happen is we do our initial emergency preparedness training. The, let's say 95% of the staff have completed that. Maybe even 100% have completed, but for one reason or another, we don't have documentation that Steve completed his training. He's the only one that we're missing. Well, if we don't have that documentation, it did not happen. And so make sure that those are stored in HR somewhere, again, backed up to some kind of a, a drive on, on the network. So if we need to access this information, we have the ability to do so. And one of the important parts of that is you need to make sure that somewhere in that training, likely at the end, your staff is acknowledging that they can understand this plan because they take some kind of a test, quiz, whatever you want to call it. There's something at the end that tests their knowledge. And that's how we demonstrate their knowledge of these emergency procedures. Um, and, and then again, if we do happen to go in and whether it's on the every two year basis or just on an ad hoc basis, we update any of our policies and procedures related to emergency preparedness plans and updated uh, training needs to take place around those updated elements. Because the last thing we want to do is change something. We never tell anybody about it. And because of that, we have some kind of a failure in emergency preparedness or we do it and we train it 
but we don't have documentation to it. And then when the surveyor comes around and says, well, well why, why did this happen? This is part of your emergency preparedness plan. We don't have documentation saying that, yes, we, Steve confirmed he knows what he's doing. He took the test. He passed it, uh, said that he acknowledges he took the training, all, all those things. Again, if we don't have that in place, we cannot truly say that we're compliant with this requirement and this regulation. So then we move to testing and, and, and testing can admittedly be a, a little bit odd um, just because of the, the various things that you have to do. Um, keep in mind, you have to do at least a full scale exercise that's community based every two years. Now, if your community doesn't do anything that's, for, that's community based, you know, so there's nothing for you to take part in as an organization. Uh, you don't have anything that you can go in and take part of to show that you've done an emergency preparedness plan where the entire community takes part. Then you can actually do a facility based functional exercise. So, hey, community didn't do anything, but XYZ hospital or XYZ rural health clinic said we're going to do something ourselves. And so we go ahead and we do that every two years. And maybe the first time there's nothing there uh, for the community. And so we do it internally. Uh, the next time the community does something. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump in on that. We're going to take part and, and be a participant in that. Um, and, and so that can certainly be a way that you can change that up every couple of years. Um, you know, maybe for one reason or another, you have a, a real dedicated desire to just do something internally as an organization. You can certainly do that. Um, but just because of the interaction with other community stakeholders, I highly recommend taking part in these community-based exercises every two years if you have the ability to do so. Um, again, it just provides a little bit of that context for, okay, if this happens, who's who, here's who I'm working with at the county. Here's who I'm working with at the state. Here's who I'm working with on uh, EMS, or uh, here's who I'm working with at the fire department, whatever it is. You're developing those relationships, developing those um, uh, contacts and, and really doing a formal work through uh, of, of what this would look like if something like this were to happen in the RHC's community. Also want to point out here, if an actual emergency does occur, the RHC is exempt from engaging in the next required exercise. And so if you do have something that takes place, so let's say we're at a year and four months, and again, a tornado comes through and, and, and hits our, our town or hits our clinic. Um, that can actually count as that full-scale community exercise because you are truly, and, and this is the best exercise you can do, testing your emergency preparedness and determining, okay, how did this work? What, what might we need to do differently? All those kinds of things. So if you do have something that does take place that you would consider a uh, test of your, of your plan, that, again, that can be an IT outage. That can be uh, COVID was an example for a lot of clinics. They use that as a real world exercise because they did have to go to different staffing models. They had to communicate who should and should not come in, uh, all those sorts of things. And then, so that can actually exempt you from having to take place in the community-based exercise every two years. You also though, do have to do an additional exercise every two years, it has to be opposite the year that the full scale functional exercise took place and that can be either a second full scale, uh, apologies for the typo there, exercise, um, a mock disaster drill. So again, we're just gonna do something internally. We're gonna say this happened and just see how our plan works or a tabletop exercise where we have a facility, facilitator that gets everybody in a room and we do a group discussion using these clinically relevant emergency scenarios. So again, let's just use tornado. Tornado is gonna hit um, two blocks away from the hospital. And if that were to happen, um, how would we function? Who would we contact? And so again, it's really more of that internal, let's just get around a table and talk this through and see if there's areas where we need to update what we have down as our policies and procedures related to this emergency preparedness plan specific item. Uh, but you do have to have that in addition to those community-based exercises. So testing and the documentation of that testing are critical need to show who was present, uh, have them sign off as being present. Uh, when did it take place? What did we discuss? What did we decide? Um, you know, after everything was, was all said and done, what did we see as areas of opportunity for improvement for the clinic uh, related to the disaster that we, that we tested on? 
um, just a lot of different pieces of documentation that you want to have completed and available if and when that surveyor is to ask for it to verify that, yes, you've complied uh, with this part of uh, the, the requirements under the regulations. Staying with testing then, um, we have to, again, analyze the response and maintain documentation of all drills. We, we talked about that already. The big piece here is the second bullet point, revising the emergency preparedness plan as needed. I would say it's likely gonna be very rare that anybody goes through a test or an actual exercise, whichever it may be, and doesn't find at least a couple ways that their plan can be updated somehow, some way. Now, maybe if you've been established for years on end and you've been through three, four, or five of these, you know, different tests and programs, um, th then yeah, maybe your your emergency preparedness plan is is somewhat static, and you've you've probably identified some of those changes already. But if you're a newer rural health clinic and you you know really haven't gone through the test yet, and you when you did your emergency preparedness plan because you knew you were going to be asked about it. You had some theories about what would go on, but now that we've been through an actual exercise and kind of tested what we thought, you know, can we really say that, uh, you know what, we really should have changed items one, four, and six, and, and here's how we're going to do that. That's where those after action reports come in. That's where you have written documentation that says, you know what, we identified that we need to change these items, and here's how we're going to change those. The key then is making sure that that plan gets updated based on that after action report. So if our after action report states that we're gonna change items one, four, and six, we better change items one, four, and six in our actual emergency preparedness plan. Because I can tell you right now, if a surveyor is reviewing that plan, sits down and, and looks at that and says, you said you were gonna change these, but this looks the exact same as, as what we had, or I don't see a, an edit date or, um, it doesn't look like they've been changed, you know, based on what you said that you were going to do in your after action report. Um, right then and there, you have a potential issue with your surveyor. Uh, they, they may have a lot of issues with that and, and potentially could have a deficiency finding. So, you know, again, the revision of that plan is critical. And, and uh, again, it, it's likely going to happen at least the first few times that you do this because, um, you know, if it's the first time that we test on tornado, okay, what do we find out? What do we need to change? Because fire, here's what we thought we were going to do, didn't work the best. And so, yeah, we do need to change that. And, and here's how we're going to do that. So we just need to be very mindful that we're not just done because we've done a, a test. You know, that, that's not the end of the line. The end of the line then is that look back and say, okay, here's what we did well. Here's what didn't work so well. And here's the edits that we need to make. Then we make those edits. And then, of course, now we've made a change to our plan. So what do we have to do? We have to train. Train individuals on what the new plan is, what the new procedures are. Uh, again, maintain that documentation. Make sure they have some kind of a test or quiz at the end to prove uh, that they understand what they're doing. Um, and, and again, we just need to make sure that everyone is on the same page so that if this were to happen again, or let's say it was a test and it happens in real life, we don't have questions on, well, we said we were going to do this over here. Well, no, that was the last version. Now we're going to do this over here. We have to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So make sure you have your documentation, after action report, um, trace that back to updates that are made in your policy and procedures, uh, trace that back to changes made in the plan itself, and then train those individuals and make sure we have that documentation related to that training stating that they understand what's going on. And we give them the opportunity to ask questions if they have them. Uh, maybe they have ideas that, that we might further implement. Um, we need to make sure that this isn't just us as administration, you know, giving down an edict to those that, that work in the clinic. This really does need to be an all hands on deck. You know, how do we think we would best cope with X, Y, Z should it happen? We have been getting a lot of questions around integrated healthcare systems and I am a rural health clinic who is a part of a hospital system. Why do I have to go in and create my own uh, emergency preparedness plan when I know the hospital already has one that's in place? Why can't I just take part in their plans and make reference to that in my documentation at the clinic? And the answer is you can. You just, again, like with everything else, have to make sure that the documentation supports that you are an active participant in everything that the hospital was doing. 
And so, uh, again, you do have that ability to incorporate into the hospital's emergency preparedness plan. However, if you are to do that, uh, again, documentation is key. You have to show that the facility participated in any training, uh, policy and procedure development, um, any kind of um, testing uh, that gets done about the plan, any kind of real events that take place under the plan. You have to be able to show that each facility, so let's say you have four RHCs and they all want to be a part of the hospital's emergency preparedness plan. You have to show that all of those four were present and active participants in that plan. So how do we do that? Well, attendance records at meetings, attendance records at testing, um, sign-offs uh, by these uh, individuals that lead those four RHCs stating, yes, we, we took place in this and, and we agree, this is, this is how we should move forward. Um, you have to be able to show that they are active participants. I would also call them out by name uh, in any policies and procedures. Again, just to go to that extra level to say that, hey, we're not just saying that this is the hospital's thing and the rural health clinics are going to be invited to come in and sit in the back of the room in the hopes of meeting this requirement. This is, these four RHCs are active participants in the development and maintenance of our emergency preparedness plan. And here's the entities that are involved. And then see our attendance logs uh, for proof of who was present uh, as these various items were completed. So again, we have that documentation to show compliance that each of these facilities were there. We also have to take into account each facility's unique circumstances. So you know, we go back to the risk assessment. We can't just say that all of our RHCs have the exact same risks at the exact same levels um, for all of them, regardless of location. Now, it very well may be that they end up being that way. And, and, and that's okay. You can talk to the surveyor about that. Um, yeah, you know, they're, they're three blocks away from each other. So there's no real difference in environmental. Uh, we know the IT risks are gonna be about the same. Um, personnel and, and, and people risks are, are likely the same. So it's possible that you could have that. But if you have some that, again, are in low-lying areas where flooding could be a problem and others that are more high-lying areas that, that really flooding isn't an issue, you need to make sure that those differences exist when they look at those risk assessments to say, you know, hey, this is or isn't the case. Or, or, or again, maybe they do match, but you just need to be able to support that. You can't just make that a blanket statement across the board without really going through the exercise of determining what those risks ultimately might be uh, for the various facilities. You have to demonstrate that each facility is capable of using the program. So, um, you know, again, if you have a provider-based clinic that is 30 miles away, you have to show that that clinic is gonna be able to utilize the program being, being implemented by the hospital and that you can comply with that. So uh, again, you have to be present at those meetings. Um, you know, you, if you're doing a tabletop, I would highly recommend being on site, uh, especially as we start to talk about uh, physical plant or um, environmental type items. It's good to be on site so you can see exactly what is going on. Um, and we just need to be able to show that, yes, we, we can comply with this, even though we may be X miles away or, or those sorts of things. Um, and, and then again, the integrated policies and procedures, communication plan and testing and training, make sure that those rural health clinics are called out in each one of those documents by name. Um, it's just a good way for a surveyor to see that, oh yeah, XYZ rural health clinic is a part of this. And so is one, two, three rural health clinic. Um, you know, again, we have sign-offs related to policies and procedures. We have sign-offs related to participation in testing and training programs. Uh, the, you know, all those things we have to clearly show that we're not just trying to piggyback off of something so that we don't have to develop it internally. We are active participants and developers of what these plans are, and we're involved in the you know, ever-evolving nature of an emergency preparedness plan for the system as a whole. So very long-winded way to say that, yes, if you are a rural health clinic that's a part of a health system, you can take part and utilize that health system's emergency preparedness plan, their testing, their training, everything else. You just need to make sure that the documentation is very clear that yes, we were active participants in this and it can't just be, here's our document and all it talks about is the hospital. That's not gonna fly for a surveyor. You have to make sure that it's very clear you were active participants. So, okay, we, we've got our plan, we've tested, we've trained, we've developed this thing over time. What's gonna happen 
when that surveyor ultimately shows up and what do I need to be prepared for? So first and foremost is, is going to be copies of the emergency preparedness plan. They're going to want to see what trainings have taken place. Uh, they're going to want to see what kind of training offerings have been offered. Um, has all new staff completed everything that they need to? Does your policy and procedure manual say you're going to do annual trainings? And if so, you better have annual training documentation that's present. Um, they're going to look at a sampling. They, they likely won't look at everyone, but they're going to look at a sampling of the training files that you have for your staff. So Steve has been with you for six years, and you said that you were going to train on emergency preparedness every two years. So I better see three acknowledgments and pass tests for Steve that show that he has indeed passed our training, understands what's going to be required, uh, and knows what to expect under our program. If you know we've got it in year two and we've got it in year six, but we're missing year four, again, that's where some of those deficiencies could potentially come in. And you know, if a surveyor is to see that, hey, we didn't have all the documentation for Steve, maybe I need to look a little bit deeper. And, and so all of a sudden that sample size may start to grow. So just make sure, again, you have all this training on file. I would recommend doing a spot check audit probably every year, just to make sure who has had their emergency preparedness training, who hasn't, let's track those folks down, get that done so we can get that training record in the books and, and, and qualify or uh, satisfy, I should say, um, the requirement for that two-year period. Um, and again, you know, we recommend retraining at least the past two cycles of, of training documentation. So, you know, we wanna make sure that we have the ability to show beyond just two years, how often these staff members have been trained on our emergency preparedness plan. If we can only show two years, then from a surveyor's perspective, you know, there's really not an, an ability to say that, yeah, you've, you've done this over time. Um, especially if this is going to be maintained, you know, on this, on the network somewhere as part of an, an HR shared drive uh, that just documents all those trainings. I, I would have as many of these as you can on hand, but at least the past two cycles. Quite frankly, if you can run that out to five cycles, fantastic. Keep that documentation. The more documentation you can show a surveyor that shows that you're complying with requirements, the better off you're going to be. So again, at least the past two cycles, ideally, I would take that out as long as you potentially could uh, to make sure that you have all that in place if it were to ultimately be asked for. Lastly, the surveyor is going to absolutely interview staff and ask questions regarding trainings and verifying that they know what to do based on your program. So they may ask your reception staff, hey, um, if we have an active shooter, what's, what's the procedure to notify individuals? Um, and, and what are we gonna do? How do we shelter? You know, Whatever those questions may be, they're gonna ask some specifics around what are you going to do as a clinic based on the risk that you've identified? Uh, same thing for maybe a tornado. Um, you know, they may want to know how you are going to communicate uh, to your staff that you know, that there's a tornado in the area. Yeah, everyone needs to take shelter. Where do they take shelter? All those sorts of things. They're going to ask them about the trainings. They're going to ask them about uh, testing they may have been a part of. And they're absolutely going to make sure that, and again, this is on a sampling basis. They're not going to go deep in the weeds, but they are going to want to make sure that they're satisfied that the staff in your clinic knows what to do in the event that XYZ situation were to take place. And it's all based on information that you've identified as a part of your risk assessment. So, you know, if I'm in Kansas, I'm not gonna be asked about what is my clinic gonna do in the event of a hurricane? It's not a risk for me, we're, we're not training on that. Now, if you wanna talk tornado, here's everything that we do. So it is gonna be specific to your program. Um, and, and that's part of the reason that they review that program before they go and, and they do some of those interviews. Uh, but they will try to make sure that individuals are aware of what they're supposed to do, what kind of trainings they've, they've received, all those sorts of things. Uh, they're also going to look for documentation. So they're going to want to know what kind of participation has management and staff had in the plan. Well, again, this is where your attendance logs come into play. Absolutely. We tested on Tornado back on January 16th. Uh, here is the sign-in sheet for all the individuals that were involved. Uh, stating that they participated in and, and understand what the emergency preparedness plan is related to that disaster. Um, and, and so they can have that. They'll review documentation related to exercises that, that have taken place. Again, they're looking for who was there, who was trained, 
um, what was done, what was the after action report, all those sorts of things they're gonna wanna see documentation for. Uh, again, if, if we were unable to participate in a community-based exercise, they're gonna wanna know why. Uh, so we have to be able to show that, yeah, we reached out to the county and, and they just didn't do anything this year. Um, we reached out to the fire, the EMS and the police departments, they didn't have anything planned. And so because of that, we did our own internal uh, exercise as opposed to a community-based. Again, have some documentation related to why that decision was made. And, and then ultimately, you know, what was the uh, after action report? There's really this last bullet point here. So, you know, what did we say that we were going to do? And then once we got into the test, what we, what did we identify that needed to be changed in one way or another? Um, how did we identify that it needs to be changed? So what are our new procedures going to be? Uh, maybe it's that we need to involve a, a different entity or different staff. Uh, whatever it may be, document all of those sorts of things in those after action reports so that you can then trace that back to the um, uh, the updates that are ultimately made to the policies and procedures that are within your plan. Uh, so again, we're, just, we're really trying to create that paper trail so that the surveyor can see, okay, they did a test, they identified some areas of opportunity, here's what they said they were going to do to implement those areas of opportunity, and then here's where the plan shows that they actually did do that. Um, so uh, again, just like anything else, just like anything related to med storage or the various logs that we have to have present in RHCs or um, you know, our program evaluations that, that take place every two years, it all comes down to the documentation. If you don't have proof, and if you don't have documentation that states, here's what we did, when we did, how we did, uh, here's the results of that, here's the changes that we're going to make. If you do not have that documentation present in a surveyor's mind, it never happened. That goes for training, that goes for testing, that goes for participation in hospital events, if you're going to do that, documentation is key. Make sure that you have it. Make sure that it's somewhere where it's going to be able to be obtained if and when a disaster were to take place. So uh, again, I know I harp on documentation a lot anytime I talk about compliance. I can promise you I'm probably going to do it again next week when we start to talk about uh, REC compliance at, at, at more of an umbrella level. Um, but that documentation is absolutely key. And if documentation isn't present, you know, a lot of surveys may start to have some red flags go up and may start to probe a little bit deeper into the, um, you know, uh, way that a clinic is operating. So just make sure you have all this information easily accessible, that it tracks together, that it tells that story of what we did, what we identified and, and how we've changed since then. I do want to leave you with a couple different resources here. Uh, the first is this emergency preparedness federal reg. So if anybody ever needs trouble sleeping, go out there and read 491.12. Um, it, it is a wonderful way to put yourself to bed at the end of a night if you've had a uh, long day or having some uh, difficulty sleeping. Um, you can also check out the CMS Emergency Re uh, Preparedness Response Office. Uh, that just has a lot of different ways that CMS is out there saying, hey, you know, here are some uh, documents that we can have. Here are some uh, various um, uh, items related to best practices around, around items. Just a, a good resource to go out and take a look at if you have questions around what's publicly available, what can I potentially get to to use as a starter, uh, those sorts of things. Certainly Appendix Z, uh, that specifically is for emergency preparedness. And so you can follow that and you can, again, just kind of see what's out there, um, you know, what, what may be able to happen from a uh, surveyor standpoint, what are we required to do uh, as a RHC um, under this regulation? All that's going to be spelled out in that appendix. And, and so you'll have the ability to kind of see what's going to be asked for um, and, and what ultimately can I do. Um, and then sample risk assessment tools. You, you can certainly find those out there. Um, they don't have to be anything super complex. You know, this is not um, a boil the ocean, as, as we tend to say in the firm. Uh, type of a situation, but you need to you do need to make sure it's thorough enough that you're really taking a hard look at what could potentially happen that would impact our clinics operating. And so again, is that environmental? Is that um, uh, personnel related internally? Uh, is that people related internally or externally? Is that IT related? Um, I hope nobody's been involved with change healthcare, but 
uh, you better believe that's been a, a major sticking point for a lot of organizations and, and certainly would be considered an emergency. Um, and, and so I know a lot of organizations are actually using that as their real world example um, for all of their stuff. So, um, you know, a, a lot of these items um, need to be uh, identified, um, not only in terms of their potential to occur, but also the potential impact to the to the clinic and, and how big of an impact would that be? Um, and then again, we can we can develop policies and procedures around those items um, as we go. So uh, with that, Jose, I did see your comment. I will get those copied in here. Bear with me one second uh, and I will get those put in. Um, but I do want to make sure that we open up the opportunity for any questions that, that individuals have as well before we uh, log off for the day here. All right, hearing none, I'll let everybody go ahead and get back to their days. Um, I am gonna hang on here for just a minute. I'll stop sharing my screen and then Hosea, I will have those links put out here uh, and you'll get copies of these slides as well. Thank you everybody and thank you to Steve for being here today. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to unmute your line or put them in the chat box. Otherwise, I just launched the post polling. If you, have, um, if you don't have any questions, feel free to take off after you fill those out. And thanks to the trail for being our wonderful moderators today.